<laughs> okay. All right. So we are recording. So um, I wanted to, all right, let me just get that off my screen. Okay. So I will introduce, are you guys ready or you want to wait another minute or two? Okay. All right. So I want to welcome everybody tonight uh, to our uh, online in the, no in the know to grow, um, trying to help uh, home owners, uh, or not even homeowners, anybody that would like to garden or just learn more about nature, um, kind of just be in the know. So tonight are doing, uh, we're doing uh, Ann Sherwood from the Rutgers Master Gardener in Monmouth County, and she will be presenting uh, Creating Hummingbird Habitat. We do have our next program is July 28th on ir Irresistible Irises. It's also uh, Jane Zisk. I believe, I didn't know if I just butchered her last name, I'm sorry, um, that will be coming on in two Tuesdays from now. So um, she will be on and uh, talking about all different types of irises. And for those that may have just joined and didn't catch our beginning part, um, uh, our chatter was all your videos and microphones have been disabled. So please, if you can use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, which is if you go to the bottom of your screen, um, there should be icons and you'll see a, a circle icon with three dots. If you click on that, it says more options. If you click on that at the top of that box, it says Q&A. So you can um, click on that and that'll bring up a chat section. And if you can, please um, send it to uh, Patty and I. So just send it to all of us rather than privately. And then that way we know um, we're both getting the same questions and we can figure out um, you know, uh, what's going on on our end. Um, and I understand that you guys can't see the questions. So when Patty and I answer, we will do our best to answer for uh, reiterate the question so that you guys know what we're talking about. And uh, yeah, people are just kind of pouring on now. We're at 94, so um, that's excellent. Uh, so I want to stop yapping. Um, and uh, for those of you that's your first time on, um, my name is Susan M. Hart Servideo. I am one of the horticulturists from the Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Ocean County. And tonight, uh, Patty Dixon is also on as one of our panelists, um, who is also in the office and is uh, Ready and willing to answer all, any and all questions, <laughs> so <laughs> we will uh, we will do that. Um, we will uh, Patty and I will keep ourselves muted unless there's questions. And I believe Anne, you have a space that you're leaving some time in between for questions, rather than trying to I don't want to say butt in, but pop in in the middle of your talk. Um, so um, I think did I catch everything, Patty? You did. <laughs> okay, because you know me. So I will stop talking and and I'm going to turn it over to you. So however you'd like to uh, go from there, it's, it's all yours. <laughs> okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So I'm really excited that there are so many people who are interested in hummingbirds. Um, they're just amazing, enchanting little creatures. Um, I've divided my talk up into roughly three sections, largely so that I can take a break in two places and answer any immediate questions that are necessary. But the first two sections, I call it a little biology. It's really how do you identify them? Um, what's special about hummingbirds that might affect how you plan your garden and a little bit about their migration so you know when they'll be around. And the second part, we'll just talk about what the hummingbird needs in terms of um, food. And then finally, we'll get to the good part where we put everything together and talk about how to, to create a garden that your hummingbirds will like to come back to. So I like to start at the beginning. So hummingbirds apparently began about 50 million years ago. They have a, they're shared a common ancestor with swifts. And what is similar between these two types of birds is that they are extraordinary flyers. And the name of the order is apodiformes, which means without feet. And of course, these we know that hummingbirds have feet, but the reality is they don't need feet the way other birds might. They don't walk around. They can maybe shuffle down a, a stem or something, but um, modern swifts, are found all over the world, and they're known for their long distance flight. There was one study done uh, where someone actually put GPS devices on 13 SWIFTs, and three of the 13 SWIFTs stayed in the air for 10 months without landing. Um, hummingbirds are restricted to the Western Hemisphere, 
And <clears throat> although they fly long distances, as we'll, as we'll talk about when we get to migration, um, they're more known for their acrobatic flight. They're the only um, birds that can actually fly backwards. So, um, and the without feet part will become important later on in the talk. So the hummingbirds that breed in New Jersey are the ruby turtle hummingbirds. Uh, the females are a dull gray green and the males are a very colorful green and gray. Both sexes are about the same size. <clears throat> They're very tiny. Um, the biggest hummingbirds are about three and a half inches long. And they have a little, their wingspan is just over four inches. Uh, the amazing thing is that they weigh about as much as a penny. So you can imagine what the wind can do to them. <clears throat> um, one thing that I, is, I think is interesting and different about them is they are, even though they're migratory, they are solitary. So they fly back and forth to Panama by themselves. They mate for a few days or a week, just long enough to court and create little hummingbirds. Um, and then they live completely separate lives. So it's important to remember that the juveniles that are born this year in 2020 will next month start their journey to Panama by themselves, which as someone who raised three boys is absolutely horrifying. So the other thing that I found surprising to learn is that hummingbirds live between 10 and 15 years. So they make that trek back and forth all those times. Um, they're highly visual. They have no sense of smell or virtually no sense of smell, um, but they can see very clearly and they have extraordinary mapping skills. They're very habit forming. They feed a lot in the morning and at dusk, um, and they're predictable. So if you see a hummingbird in your feeder at eight o'clock in the morning, you're likely to see that hummingbird the next day at eight o'clock in the morning. So um, the ruby-throated hummingbirds are the only ones that actually breed in New Jersey, but it's not unheard of to see other species of hum hummingbirds um, the rufous hummingbirds have, are seen almost every year. Um, they're usually in South Jersey, Cape May region. Uh, most of the sightings occur toward the, you know, when, they, when the birds would normally be migrating. Um, sometimes they stay for several months, but as you can imagine, as they run out of nectar and insects, it's not a very habitable place for them. Um, the thinking is that most of them that stray are juveniles that, that either get blown off the migratory route that they're trying to follow or just get lost. I get a number of questions about hummingbirds versus hawk moths. How do you tell the difference? And if you think about it, there's some obvious differences that are easy to spot. So um, hawk moths are about an inch smaller than the average hummingbird, so they're one to two inches long. Because they're insects, they have obvious antennae and they have six legs instead of the two short legs. Um, they have a curved proboscis that goes into the, the flower to drink nectar as opposed to a straight bill. Um, hummingbirds, even though the males are brightly colored, they have dull wings. The hawk moths have much more brightly colored wings. Sometimes they're transparent. Um, and one differentiating factor is supposed to be that you see hummingbirds in the daytime and hawk moths <clears throat> in the daytime or the evening. But honestly, this year I have two male hummingbirds who come and I see them almost every night after the sun has gone down. So I would take that with a grain of salt. But these other things are pretty obvious. Now, the males, <clears throat> excuse me, are masters of beauty and discretion disguise, as we talked about. They're the ones with the very iridescent green backs and the beautiful ruby gorget their throats. Um, what I learned that, again, I think is truly amazing is that a 
the color in hummingbirds and many other birds, as it turns out, um, is generated not by pigment. So my hair used to be brown because I had melanin. That's a pigment. Hummingbirds instead have prisms, prismatic proteins in their feathers. So the color appears when the light strikes the feather at just a particular angle. So there's a picture here of the prism. So you probably all remember from elementary school that you know, the light goes in and then it, it's refracted and bent out into different colors. Um, and that's important because, wrong way here, sorry. Um, it allows the hummingbirds to have extraordinary um, camouflage. This photo is, was taken of the same bird sitting on the same branch. The only difference is that in the right panel, <clears throat> he's turned his head. And so the light is striking the, the gorget and the prism is refracting the red light out. Um, so this is really handy if you're flying and you want to disappear, you just turn, and poof, you're gone, blend into the background. Now, where the females um, don't win out on the, the flashy colors, <clears throat> they are extraordinary when it comes to creativity and caring. Um, once they mate, they take six to 10 days to build a nest. And the nest is made from fluffy material like milkweed fluff, um, dandelions, any kind of soft material that they can find from plants. Uh, they mix that with spider webs and pine resin. And they make a little cup that they attach with spider webs to the branch. Um, when the nice little cup that's about two inches across and an inch deep is finished. They decorate the outside with lichen and moss. Of course, that's camouflage, but to me, it's quite beautiful. So there's a special advantage to using the spider silk um, in creating this. And they actually do stitch the cup to the branch. And I would encourage you to check out, there's a, a URL here it's, if you just search for hummingbird nesting material, we'll go to the nature PBS. It's two and a half minutes and it's, it shows what this bird goes through to create the nest. But the spider web is really important because um, when the eggs are laid, each one, she usually has two at a time. Each one is the size of a tic tac, so really tiny. And in the three weeks after they hatch until they fledge, they grow to be almost adult size, fully adult size. So if they had you know, either the, in the beginning, the nest would be too big, and, or at the end, they just wouldn't fit. So the spider webs allow the sides of the um, nest to stretch to fit the two birds. And so about three weeks after they're hatched, um, they do fledge. And you have to see, if you see sort of a, an increase in the number of visits to your feeder for a couple of days, that's about when the fledging is happening because the mother shows them all around the neighborhood. So she says, okay, guys, this is the feeder. These are the cardinal flowers, blah, blah, blah. And then she lets them on the own. And you know, you will read that you can put things out to attract the nesting mothers. Um, I think the bottom line is you just want to make sure that you don't clean up your yard so thoroughly that there are no spider webs around. Um, you can plant trees that have slender ascending branches. Apparently, um, hummingbirds nest often in oak and hornbeam and birch and poplar. And I've seen <clears throat> some products advertised sorry, um, where you can, the rectangles, I'll show you in a picture later on, that are filled with cotton and all kinds of fabric um, that you can hang in your garden. I don't know whether they're safe or useful. Um, 
I tend to think that since these birds have been doing this for 50 million years, they probably don't need cotton to uh, our help with that. So that's just my personal opinion. Okay, so um, as the summer progresses and the hours of daylight shrink and the food sources, the nectar sources change, that signals it's time to move on. Um, the males leave first, they usually leave around August, they'll start in a month or so. And as I mentioned before, they're solitary flyers. They think, people that study hummingbirds, think that they probably follow the same path each year. But again, going back to the, the very short legs, it's almost impossible to ban hummingbirds. There are people who are certified to do that. But most of the information they have about their habits are from birds that are kept in captivity. So they don't know much about how they navigate or whether they take the same path. Again, they believe they come back to, your, to the same nesting places each year. Um, but I don't know that anybody's actually documented that. Um, the solitary flyers fly during the day, which is unlike songbirds, which fly at night. And they fly just above the treetops or the water, which is probably because that's where the insects are and that's what they, they live on. Um, they hop along when they're over land it's at a leisurely pace. But when they get to the Gulf of Mexico and they have to fly across to Panama, their ultimate um, destination, they travel 500 miles without stopping. And it was timed once as 18 and a half hours. So you can imagine the amount of energy that takes and they really bulk up before they leave. Their wings are beating something like 1500 times a second. I'm sorry, their heart is beating 1500 times a minute and their wings are beating something somewhere between 50 and 80 times a second. So that, that's a lot of work. And it's fun to watch them come back in the spring um, or to look forward to them. Um, this map, which let me see if I can move those things. I'm assuming you can see things I have pictures over the top of my, my screen. Um, this yep. map come. We, we can, sorry, we can see we can see your mouse moving, but we can't see anything else. So you can't see the picture. I, no, I, I'm sorry. We see your screen. We just okay. don't see any of your other toggles and things like tabs. Okay. Okay. Um, it's okay. So this map came from hummingbirdcentral.com. And I, I sent Sue a, a copy of all these URLs if, um, if it's convenient for her to send them out to people. That would be good. Um, so the, this map just shows the average time that hummingbirds arrive various places in the U.S. And New Jersey, it's, they get here somewhere around April 20. So this is between the 19th and the 23rd. Um, last year, 2019 was unusual. They came closer to um, April 1st. But this year, they were back to the April 19th date. Um, and it's important to keep your, to fill your feeders early on. So you start in mid-April, you'll we'll be usually safe to, to uh, be prepared for the hungry travelers. Um, and there's some belief that if they find a place they really like on the way, they'll stop and stay. So it's a good thing to have to be prepared to um, give them some energy on the way back. And, and one of the reasons that's important is that because they're migratory, they depend on the fact that the nectar sources and the insects will be where they are at the right time. And now, particularly with climate change, that's not always in sync. So um, if you put a feeder out and give them a, a reliable source of nectar, at least that's energy they can use to move on. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the females and the migrators will move through um, New Jersey in October. 
Um, so if you keep your feeders filled from mid-April to mid-October, um, you'll be benefiting these little birds. So um, what I like to do in the spring is follow the migration. And you can do that by going to this website and they will show you day by day where people have reported sightings. And it's just fun. So this again was 2019. So they made it to New Dennisville, New, uh, New Jersey on March 29th in West Creek. I have no idea where these places are on the 2nd of April. So, um, okay, I think that's a good place to stop. If there are any questions that need immediate attention. Oh, I didn't realize I left myself unmuted, but um, West Creek is down by me in Manahawkin at the uh, oh. southern end of Ocean County. So if you're wondering there. Um, one of the questions that I did answer was how does sugar water give them nourishment and what kind of nourishment is in the sugar? It. I'll get into that in just a minute. Oh, okay. Yes. I kind of answered. I hope I answered correctly. And then Patty has one. Um, we have a question from Joanne. What month in Central Jersey? What is a typical month in Central Jersey when hummingbirds would hatch and fledge? She lives in Union. I would say likely this about now, the end of an end of July is when you'll see the first. Fledging. Sometimes they have two, two. Uh, I don't know whether you call them clutches or two sets of families um, a year, and that's one of the reasons that the females stay longer. So the males mate and take off, and the female stays and does her thing, and then the other part of the family leaves in October. They did, uh, Terry Benson is tracking the migration path on the hummingbirdcentral.org site. Is that? Yes. Okay. I think that's, it's whatever here. Let me go back. Yes, you can find the information on okay. Hummingbird Hummingbird Hummingbird. Central. Uh, It's hummingbirdcentral.com, it looks like on there, on your website, right. not org. Okay. Right. We got another question. Um, referring to the monsoon we had the other day, how do hummingbirds fly in that kind of weather? They do fly in that kind of weather. I actually had one at my feeder in the middle of the monsoon. Um, I haven't looked at, you, if you go on the web, there's endless numbers of, of YouTube videos and there are scientists who have studied how they do it. Um, but by you know putting them in a in captivity and using hoses, and they do just fine. But I can't remember what the motion is of their wings. But they're undeterred. And uh, uh, two more questions, and then we'll let you. Um, a, a simple one. Um, sorry. Uh, just somebody was commenting about two years in a row. I've had a hummingbird. This is from Nancy um, in November. Um, the Rufus was banded in my kitchen and the other was a ruby throated. So she ah. saw those in November. And um, Lisa asked, could you define fledgling? Oh, a fledgling is um, a bird that's old enough just learning to fly. So before it can, fledging means its first flight. And I did say it was like, oh, okay, Patty's answering, I think, on. Uh, yeah, because she, she's going to talk about that. Okay. I believe, yeah. Predators, that was the. Yeah, oh, so yes. we'll talk. That's, yeah, yeah you talk about that. Okay. Okay. So yes. Should we go ahead? Go yes. Okay. So what's on the menu? Um, as I mentioned before, feeders provide a constant source of energy for uh, migrating birds uh, when there might not be net natural net natural nectar sources say that three times um but generally you really you want to be able to provide natural sources for them um, but if you do put out a feeder it's important i probably should have reordered these bullets the most important thing about a feeder is to make sure that it's easy to take apart and clean 
And the one that I have here is recommended by Audubon. And I have this, and it's really simple. You just pop off the top, um, and everything is easy to clean, and it's great. Um, they recommend, again, this is from Audubon, they recommend using red parts and not yellow parts. Um, the birds are attracted to the red, and bees and wasps like to come to the yellow. I have no experience with feeders that have yellow on them, so I can't verify that. But I have not had a problem using this particular uh, feeder. The other thing that's nice about this is it's got a, a built-in ant moat. So if an ant crawls up my shepherd's hook and then down the hanger, it has to cross water before it can get here to the inlets for the birds so that the uh, nectar is down here. Um, if you, not all of, not all feeders come with those built in and you can buy um, some that are independent and you can just install them on the, the hangers if necessary, but otherwise you can just have swarms. Um, so where's the best place to put them? Well, you want it to be visible to the birds, of course, but most importantly, you want it to be visible to you so you can enjoy them because that's part of why you're doing this. So you want to put it near when you sit. I mean, I put mine by the window where I eat breakfast, for example. Um, you want them to be convenient to go out to and take down to fill and, and clean. Um, it's important to put them where they're not going to, where the birds are not going to collide into windows. Um, I think that's a rare happenstance because you can actually get feeders that attach to the windows. And I've had them look in the window at me. Um, so it would just be thinking about making sure that the bird can see that the glass is there. Um, I don't think it's as big a problem as you know, skyscrapers and birds flying. Um, and you want it to be safe from predators and probably the biggest predator is Um, sorry, you want some nearby shade. They like to feed in the sun, but they like some dappled shade um, for resting and for nesting. And again, you don't want to put it someplace where there's a wind tunnel because they're little and they're not, not as likely to come feed. And I strongly advise you to make your own feeder solution. Um, it's incredibly easy and inexpensive. Um, we use one part sugar or four parts of boiling water. So I have a four cup Pyrex measuring cup. I take a rolling boiling water and pour four cups into that Pyrex. And then I put a cup of plain, ordinary white granulated sugar in, stir it, and let it cool. Um, the commercial products that have red dye in them. First of all, it's unnecessary because nectar is not red. So the bird may be attracted to a red flower, but the nectar doesn't care what color that is. Um, and some of the dyes are actually poisonous and can be harmful to the birds. Um, honey may seem like a healthy alternative, but it's not. It contains antibiotics and um, other things that can, again, make the hummingbird sick. The same thing is true of raw sugar. So you wanna make sure you use plain, ordinary, or granulated sugar. And keep the proportions, one cup of sugar to four cups of water. You can scale that up or down. You can have you know, one cup of water and a quarter cup of sugar, but just keep those proportions the same. It's very easy. If you make extra, you can keep it in the refrigerator as soon as you as long as you put it in quickly so that it doesn't get contaminated. And it's, this is why it's important to be able to take it apart, and take it down and take it apart frequently. Um, you need to change the solution because the sugar water can ferment and it can get bacteria or more likely fungus in it um, that can make the, the birds sick. And I like to think they probably just wouldn't. You know, they know there was something wrong, but I don't know. Um, 
So in the spring and the fall, I might change it once a week, but this time of year, I change the um, nectar and clean the container every two or three days. Um, and it's not hard to do. So I take the beater down, dump out the old nectar, slosh it around in some hot soapy water. I have to use just one drop of biodegradable seventh generation detergent. Um, and then I rinse it really, really well with tap water. And then I fill it up with boiling water um, and let it cool. So that should kill most things um, for a couple of days. And again, you want to have natural sources of energy for them as well. Um, they drink nectar from between 1,000 and 2,000 flowers a day. And so that doesn't mean they're going around the neighborhood to different flowers, um, but they go back to the same flower over and over again. They know they can learn very quickly how fast it fills up after they drink from it. Um, people have done experiments where, again, in captivity, they used artificial flowers and they filled them with nectar and arranged it so that some of them took 10 minutes to refill, others took 20, others took 30, and it took the birds less than a, a day and a half to figure out which ones filled fastest and go back to those flowers over and over again. Um, they prefer large tubular flowers, although that's certainly not um, exclusive. Um, this is a cardinal flower. I have them in my yard and I love them. I have them next to one of my feeders and they invariably go to the flower before they go to the feeder. Um, they prefer red blossoms, but they'll go to other colors as well. Um, and I saw this for the first time this year. They actually will go up to the tree where a woodpecker has tapped into the side of the tree and they drink sap. I couldn't believe my eyes. This slide is apropos of absolutely nothing, but it just blows me away. And the kids love this. This is their favorite, favorite picture. Who knew that hummingbirds invented the hose reel? Their tongues are so long that when they retract them, they have to wrap them around their brains. I think that's pretty cool. It turns out woodpeckers do the same thing. So um, someone was asking about nutrition. Yes, they rely heavily on nectar and sugar water for energy, but they need protein and other nutrients just like we all do. And insects make up 50% of their food. They like small, easy to, to uh, grab. I mean, they're small, so they're not going to go after something. Um, and they generally capture their prey in midair. Um, sometimes they'll take them out of sap wells or leaves if something's caught in a spider web, um, but their beaks are not designed to go into a flower, for example, and pull out an insect. Their beaks are flexible, that's what this arrow shows. Um, if I were doing this in person, I would be using my hands to tell you how to but we'll just have to suffice here. Um, it just, the, because the beak can bend a little bit here, it increases the amount of surface where they can fly and capture something. Um, they also will consume pollen, which is nutritious. Okay, so that's, we're at the point where you could, are there questions from the, okay. How are we doing on time? We're good. It's uh, five after seven. Okay. Um, Perfect. So you're, you, you're good. Um, I'm assuming you're good. Uh, Patty, go ahead with the question that you, um, if you want to, it might be easier. Um, oh, did I mention? Yes. Myself? No, no. <laughs> um, someone asked if it was, I guess they read that they use distilled white vinegar to clean the feeder. Is that okay? Um, I don't see why not, but I would rinse it out really well and again use um, 
boiling water to, to kill anything extra, but I don't see why vinegar would be a problem. Um, high rise. So someone asked if they live in a high rise on the 12th floor, would the hummingbirds go up that high? That's a good question. They go 40 feet to nest. Um, I don't know. Is the simple answer. I can try to find out. I think too, you could try it if you know that the hummingbirds are in the area at a lower level, like maybe somebody lower in the, in the um, development has, or condominium has that, has it. Uh, That's that, a good uh, idea. You, know, you could at least try and see. Um, I had a question about uh, somebody wanted to know how do you deter raccoons? They put their feeder, I guess they feel like they have to bring their feeder in at night because they have a raccoon issue. The raccoons try to get it. I have never heard of that. I know I have a friend who lives in Colorado and she has bears and she has to take them in at night because of the bears, but I've never heard of raccoons. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, I think probably taking them in is the best a solution because they can they can get into anything sorry i don't have a better answer no no that's that's good um the last uh, the one question that i saw earlier too was about um someone has a red feeder sorry i didn't write your name down uh red feeder um that are covered in tiny ants so now what do you do um is it just uh, patty had suggested to move the feeder around every couple of days i guess the, bir the birds will find it? Yeah, that, that's what I do, because I have a porch with a couple of different hooks, and I literally just move it from hook to hook, you know, so it's in the same area, and it confuses the ants. <laughs> and if I see them kind of going towards, you know, that section where it is, I move it over. So every couple days, and I don't have ants on the feeder. It's awesome. I would also suggest that you just check to make sure your feeder isn't leaking because if you put the top on tightly and make sure the outside is clean um, and you have an ant moat, it shouldn't, they shouldn't be able to get there. But again, they're amazing creatures. So if moving it around works, that's great too. Yeah, that's awesome. But I would suggest looking into an ant moat. All else okay. fails. And I saw an, a question in the chat from Laura. Um, she had put her bird feeder, her hummingbird feeder out a couple of weeks uh, ago, uh, three weeks ago, I believe Laura's in uh, Ocean County and um, she, nobody came to, to feed it. So she put it away. Should she have left it out longer? I think yes. <laughs> I would say yes. I had other years I've had, I don't know, probably two females with their broods and a couple of males. This year I have just two males and I saw them at first in the end of April and then they disappeared for a couple of weeks. And now, you know, they've come back. And I think it's probably just that I'm not seeing them. You know, I made the mistake. Well, no, it wasn't a mistake. I started a feed on our next door local email exchange. Got in the beginning of the pandemic got everybody excited about the hummingbirds and i think one of the reasons i don't have as many birds this year is that everybody else in the neighborhood got eaters and hung them out and they're all going to somebody else's house but yes i think it's worth a try um you know it doesn't it doesn't hurt anything to have it there except the time it takes you to mix up the sugar water so give it a shot especially now because it fledging time so and uh, the one last, uh, somebody mentioned um, hummingbirds. They've seen hummingbirds sipping from grape jelly that was intended for Baltimore Orioles. Uh, I guess the sugars, uh, I don't know, it's sugary. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, I've never heard of that, but I don't doubt it for a minute. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I think the only other, I see at least one other comment, but uh, that's something you're going to be talking about. Um, creating the garden, so it'll come in there. Uh, other birds, are other birds predators of the hummingbird? Um, that's a good question. I've read that hummingbirds appear to make their nests close to raptor nests. And they think that that's because a hummingbird is like not even worth the energy to a large bird. 
and that but the the raptors would feed on crows and things that might go after hummingbirds and their eggs. Um, so I'm assuming that yes, some of the smaller you know, um, sharp shin hawks and things like that probably would go after hummingbirds. But hummingbirds are so fast and they don't stop the way other birds do at a feeder, for example. Um, okay. I don't know, but yeah. And I uh, do see one last question or qu comment. Uh, if you cover your hook with Vaseline, uh, that keeps the ants off. That was from Joanne Kruger. It might be a little messy for you to pick up, but. <laughs> That's a good idea. So that might be another. Okay. I'll okay. See. Yeah, I think that covered, Patty, did that cover everybody that you saw? Um, Cora moment. asked if they eat anything else, but that's kind of. They, um, I've heard that you can put food out for them, I think. Basically, you, they get their nutrition from nectar and from insects and pollen. So I think that's that's really all you need to provide. So flowers and if you have a feeder. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So. Okay, so we've been through some of this. Um, so I'll go really fast with this, just when you're planning where to put your, your feeders, um, it's a good idea to know what direction you're putting them in. Um, because as I mentioned before, they like sun when they're feeding and they like a, a shadier place to rest and for their nests. Uh, you want to protect them from the wind and predators. Um, but the two things that are really probably most important about where you locate putting a feeder or your garden is um, to put it where you can see the activity. I mean, hummingbirds are just, I could spend hours watching them. They're so funny and so entertaining. Um, and also, when I put my feeder up, originally I put it on the east side of my house, so that would be like over here. It doesn't matter in this picture, but um, because that's where I would sit to feed my breakfast. Um, but the male birds looked black and white because of this they were backlit from the, the morning sun. And now I have one on the north side of the house and I can see the living color. It's gorgeous. And, and in fact, it's below my bedroom window and I like to look out and see them from the top. It's, it's really pretty. So that may take a little experimenting um, to find out the best place to put them. Um, where you can see the colors in the males. And another consideration in locating gardens and, and feeders is anger management. Like any small thing that feeds largely on sugar water, they can be feisty. Um, the recommendations are to use multiple feeders so there's less competition. Um, I'm not sure that that makes a big difference, but it may. Um, if you're making a garden, have one that is freestanding so it can be approached from both sides. Um, and just if you put, if you find that you have a pair that are really fighting a lot, you can put um, two feet, two food sources out of sight of each other. So one is feeding it in the garden on the east and the other one can go to the north and you know, get his fill without being attacked. Um, people have reported to me that they'll have an aggressive bird that sits on a branch near the feeder or near the, the garden. And when they see other birds feeding, they dive bomb. So one solution to that is to simply, if you can, prune back the branch so it's a little bit farther away and less attractive. Um, and there is some evidence that they're more apt to be, to fight if, they're, if they feel threatened by other predators. So again, if you keep the feeder in a place where they aren't worrying about cats and other birds and so forth, um, that may help. Um, I, I think it's probably a matter of, um, and again, this is speculation on my part, but if, 
if they've mapped out a plan and they know that the flower in such and such a place is going to fill up with nectar at a particular time, whatever their time scale is, um, they don't want some other creature to go over and change the pattern. So um, I think that's probably one of the reasons that they're very defensive. It doesn't appear to be that they're protecting the young, although the mothers may. Okay, so one of the nice things about one of the nice things about creating a garden for hummingbirds is that it's very easy and it doesn't mean that you have to tear everything out and put in a new garden. Um, in fact, it can be something as simple as a hanging plant if you have if you don't have a yard on your porch or on your balcony or something like that. Um, but if you are planting in the garden, you want succession blooming so that you have nectar sources throughout the course of the year in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, but you can just add plants to your existing garden. So if you've got a sunny spot, it's got good water, you can put in a cardinal plant. Um, and most of the things that you're, that hummingbirds like, all kinds of other pollinators like as well. Um, you can plant in tiers because, you, you know, so you have a, a low group of plantings and then a medium size and a tall group so that you, you can see them all. So that you don't want the bird to sort of get buried and you never get to see it. Um, and then for your own um, sake, you can just group plants that have similar needs, similar water and fertilizing together. Um, and then you can add in feeders and water sources. So what, what actually attracts them? Um, clearly, the color red um, is attractive to them. They can also see ultraviolet um, and reflection from, from foliage. And I'm not sure how you plan that. Um, it just may be experimentation. Um, and as I mentioned before, they um, visit the same plants repeatedly. They know how fast they refill they know which flowers have the most nectar, the richest nectar. Um, so those are the things that they're attracted to. Okay. Um, I would encourage you to consider adding native plants to your garden for the, the hummingbirds. Um, they tend to have more nectar than cultivated hybrids and other non-natives. Um, they support more insects and spiders that the hummingbirds use for food. Um, and they're just simply easier to care for because like the hummingbirds have been here for 50 million years, they've grown up here, evolved over time to the seasons and the climates. Um, and this is the handout that either you have or will get shortly. Um, and it takes all of the information that I've just poured out um, and condenses it into a very simple three or four page document. Um, what I like about it is it tells you the common names, the botanical name, what it attracts. So is it butterflies or hummingbirds? Is it a native plant? Is it a, an annual or perennial or a tender shrub? When does it bloom? Or is it ranked across the summer? Um, does it like sun or shade? And the color. So it makes it very easy to plan, <clears throat> excuse me, for succession um, flowering in your garden. So that's what I've done here. I'm not going to go through each plant, but um, I took spring, early summer, late summer, and fall. These are the tall plants that bloom at that time, medium, so forth. And these are the low, smallest, um, low growing plants. In all different colors. So that tool is very useful and easy to use um, to find a selection of plants that the hummingbirds will like and other pollinators will like. Um, it also includes lists of um, various vines that um, they're attracted by. I mean, everybody has honeysuckle in their yard. Everybody loves honeysuckle, even though it's a non-native. Um, I have one little section that I keep just for the hummingbirds. You, 
can just add some attractive annuals and the lantana and zinnia will certainly um, sort of argue against them only going to long tubular flowers, although those seem to be their favorites. And this is easy to do and, and inexpensive. You can, um, th the same handout has information about trees and shrubs that, that hummingbirds like um, nesting. And then that brings us to water sources. And again, we go back to the A of formulas, the short legs, um, which, you know, whatever. Hummingbirds get most of their, drink, their water from nectar, so they, they don't drink from your, um, your bird bath. And they like, they're attracted to the sound of running water, as it turns out. Um, I know I, when I water with a hose, they'll show up and fly through the, if it's a, a soft mist. Um, so they like waterfalls, they like fountains, they like whisters. Um, bird baths, not so much. And if you think about, they can't walk around on, in a bird bath. I've, and in most cases, they're too deep for their very tiny legs. I've seen things that say, well, you can put some stones at one side of your bird, of your bird bath and make it more shallow, but I'm not... I'm not sure that's worth it. I mean, you wouldn't say get rid of your bird bath, but um, that's not going to attract them the same way a little fountain. Um, and then last but not least, I feel a responsibility if I'm going to put a feeder out particularly or any kind of flowers to attract hummingbirds or any other birds um, to make sure that it's safe for them. And if you think about the fact that they're so tiny and they consume so much. Um, it's imperative that where you're trying to encourage them to come, that you don't use pesticides, herbicides, or um, insecticides because they're very susceptible to poison. Um, I have a cat. I love cats, but I keep her inside because I know she'll go after the birds in the area. Um, and it's if you let your cat out, just make sure you don't create a situation like the one in the picture where the cat's sitting there just waiting for her chance or his chance. Um, and again, keep, protect from insects and bees and wasps. Um, prevent infection by cleaning and changing the solution. And again, I'm not so sure what, how much how important it is to place feeders to minimize what window crashes, but it's something to, it's worth considering. And then I have good news. I don't know if you've seen these, but um, a couple of years ago on YouTube, there were several really gruesome videos of praying mantises mortally wounding hummingbirds. And I was distraught by this because I want green mantises in my garden. Um, but I didn't want to jeopardize the hummingbirds. And according to Audubon, the benefits of the mantids, mantises far outweigh the risks to the hummingbird. Um, they don't, a praying mantis has to be really, really hungry to go after something as big as a hummingbird. Um, what they're probably doing if you see them on your feeder is going after the insects that are attracted to the, to the sugar water. Um, so you can place feeders away from shrubs and things where mantids can hide. And if you see a mantid on, on the feeder, just go over with a small stick and it'll generally just hop on and you can move it away. Um, but I don't think there's a, a high risk of um, anything bad happening. So, this slide's just a reminder that there are master gardeners throughout New Jersey and we're here to answer your questions or help you find answers to your questions. Uh, this is the Monmouth County helpline, but I'm sure you can find one near to your home. Um, this just tells you that we follow the law. Um, and I'd like to say thank you. I really appreciate your getting on and listening to me and I hope you enjoyed it.
<laughs> thank you. I forgot to unmute myself. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. um, and thank just you. again, I'd like to just mention that these are some other really useful um, URLs. The top one I just discovered is um, an Audubon um, organization that does um, citizen science. So they want you to track what plants the hummingbirds are going to in New York. So I haven't checked it out yet. But I intend to. That's on the list I sent you. Okay. okay. Um, yep. A couple of things for those people that are still on. There will be a survey after we finish. We do still have a few questions. There was at least three I saw that um, might be of interest for everyone to uh, hang out with. Um, as soon as I stop the uh, the program, then the uh, survey will pop up so if you wouldn't mind taking the time to do that we will have a recording of this and uh the handouts if the handouts aren't sent out tomorrow um if you miss them we will have them available as part of the uh when the recording is up on our Rutgers uh ocean county website um we do have we will have the recordings there with the handouts so um before uh so we don't lose too many more people on here um someone asked about mosquito dunks uh, using mosquito dunks in a pond, is that harmful to the to the hummingbirds? I can't answer that. Okay. Um, honestly, I would guess that you know, the hummingbird's probably not going to go in the pond. But I don't have to say one or the other about that. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think that mosquito dunks, um, really, you don't need mosquito dunks in a pond if it's running water. Um, running water deters mosquitoes from laying their eggs. It's when it's stagnant. Um, so if it's stagnant water, I don't know that the hummingbirds would go there. It sounds like they do kind of prefer some more splashing or, or some more other water sources. Um, so that's a that uh, I think that that's where that is. And I had one other specific. Are the part are the populations here um, pretty stable? They are. From what I've read, there you know, hummingbirds are not endangered. There's some effect of climate change on some of the other species where they seem to be moving farther north. Um, but the ruby-throated hummingbirds are doing, doing okay. And I think it's in part because we all pitch in and give them a little more. We're careful. Okay. Uh, Patty, did you have any others that you noticed right off the top of your head? Um, there is a new one that just came in that they want to put a feeder near the north facing porch. Do they need to put plants in as well? I don't think you have to, but I think it's, you know, it's, that's preferable to have plants that they like. Also, you no, know, I have one on the north side and there are no flowers. So, you know, it's along the path. And I think too, if you had a, a planter, you could just do it with a pot of flowers too. You don't have to actually plant in the ground if that's a problem in that's that area. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there was one I'll answer real quick. Uh, there was a, when will the video, uh, where will the video be posted? It will be post, oh, Patty's writing an answer, sorry. Uh, it well, will be posted on the, it. yeah, it'll be posted on the um, Ocean County, the Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Ocean County's website. And it's on the front page when you go to, so you can just look up RCE Ocean County and uh, that will pop up and you'll come to our, our website um, and it'll be there um, as a link. You can click on the link and then it'll allow you to download. There is actually a survey at that point too, if you do download the or, or watch the video. Um, and one question, what do you do if a hummingbird flies into a window and is injured? Uh, is there someone to take care of them? I believe there probably are wildlife management people, but you may be able to direct people better than I can to that. Okay. Um, I do actually know a man in Tom's River um, who is a wildlife rehabber and particularly for birds. I don't have his phone number, but his name is Don Bonica. I can type it there, but he's, he's a wildlife rehabber in Tom's River um, and definitely specializes in birds. That's Tom's River, though. Um, I also, oh, sorry. Also, um, in our office, um, uh, Amelia Valente, who was uh, formerly with Monmouth County 4-H, is with our 4-H in Ocean County. Um, uh, so she is an actual wildlife rehabber, and she does know a bunch of people. We actually had a wildlife, our last video, um, 
session uh, or know to grow was uh, about wildlife caring for wildlife. So um, we could get some information that way too, or it'll be on our site with her recording that you could watch if anybody would like to do that. Okay, and I think that seems to be, I have, uh, oh, somebody said they just uh, mentioned, oh, Rob, hi, Bob, uh, Jed, uh, I have two hummingbirds coming to my Leatris um, today. That was something, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so, um, so um, I just want to thank everybody, and uh, thank you, Anne, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Anne. Um, it was very knowledgeable. I always learn something. It's always nice. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I just want to thank everybody. And please, I'll turn off the uh, the recording and the um, PowerPoint. And then if you could please take the survey and let us know. And um, we will keep presenting. And then the 28th is our, was the 28th is for the irises. Um, also, Jersey Friendly Yards uh, is also running uh, next week. Um, if you plant it, they will come. And it's regarding all different plants for uh, wildlife. Um, that is on the Jersey Friendly Yards uh, website if anybody's interested or email us at the end um, and uh, we'll, we'll get the information to you. So thank you again, Anne. I really appreciate uh, good I information. Good thank parenting. you, Anne. Good night. <laughs> All right, and good night, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Good night. Good, good night. night. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Oops, I'm hitting the wrong buttons. <laughs>